Welcome to the free sermon podcast of the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach, affiliated with Christian Fellowship Ministries. Our vision is winning souls, making disciples, and planting churches. It's Wayman Wednesday. That means you're about to hear a message from the founder of our fellowship, Pastor Wayman Mitchell. Even though he entered into his reward and is in the presence of our Lord, we still need to hear his clarion call to faithfulness, holiness, discipleship, and commitment to the cause of Christ. If you like what you hear, please support World Evangelism by subscribing to the premium version of this podcast for even more sermons. Links are in the show notes. Enjoy today's sermon. Thank you for coming to our Bible conference. We so appreciate uh, all the pastors that have come, all the workers that have come. We have had a tremendous week. Can you say amen? amen. Wonderful grace of God, revelatory preaching. Uh, God has powerfully worked, and the best is yet to come tonight as we make announcements where we're going. The book of Second Samuel, chapter 21 if you want to turn there with me in the scripture. One of the great Bible stories that almost every believer has uh, read, has used, and has uh, marveled at is the story of a young man in Israel, maybe 17 years old, goes into the battlefield when the Armies of Israel are terrified. Saul and his army are uh, intimidated and faces a, a giant named Goliath, uh, kills him, and in that moment is catapulted to leadership. Uh, and uh, his history is a phenomenal story uh, of God's blessing. However, we need to... Uh, uh, follow on in his history which is told in this passage of scripture there is a tremendous lesson here and later in life uh, there's another giant found in this passage of scripture and David must face him and he is in great danger of being killed and let me make a statement uh, this evening that there are many giants in life this scripture bears that out and I want to minister to you on the giants of old age. Verse 15, uh, 2 Samuel 21. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Then Ishbi Binab, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeriah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall, not, uh, you shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. Now it happened afterward that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then uh, Sebekai the Hushathite killed Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. Again, there was war at Gob with the Philistines, uh, where uh, El Nathan, the son of Jer Oregon, the Bethlehemite, uh, killed uh, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, uh, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again, there was war at Gath. Uh, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also was born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants, the giants of old age. One of the giants of old age is disengagement from the arena of conflict. Now, we are very familiar with the life of David. We know that uh, the story of David and Bathsheba, the scripture notes that, underlines that for us in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1 says it happened in the spring of the year. 
At the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all the uh, uh, and, and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. There is something very dangerous about disengaging yourself uh, from the arena of conflict. Stay with me for a moment. Because it is in that period of time when you are disengaged that often the giants of old age begin to appear. And in David's case, uh, it was lust. I know. You say, here he is again. He's preaching on sex. Some years ago, we in our leadership meeting, we discussed because a uh, pastor had lost his wife and during that period of time it was very apparent that he uh, had uh, let his guard down in this area and we lost him and lost uh, most of a church. And so in this leadership meeting, we're discussing that if a pastor's wife dies, uh, then uh, what are we going to do? And the discussion was that uh, in every case, perhaps, we ought to ask them to resign their church and, and uh, so on, so that they're not overtaken by some chick in the congregation that's already uh, set their sights on them. And so uh, the discussion was uh, that, uh, that we ought to do this. And then someone from the leadership table said, yeah, but, but not the old guys, you know, like uh, Pastor Mitchell and uh, Pastor Camel. And I said, no, 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 they're the worst. <laughs> Snow may be on the roof, but there's a fire in the boiler. See, what it is is an ego thing. You see, uh, this is tied up with your ego. You may be bald-headed and your chest is falling into, into your drawer, but you see, but you see this, uh, this uh, libido still is in there, and uh, there's something that is powerful in, in that period of time. You say, oh, you think I'm over the hill? Hey, listen, I'm going to you. And if you're a visitor from the local area, just uh, hang tight, fasten your seatbelt. From time to time, we have people who want to take a sabbatical. When I hear people about taking a sabbatical, the hair goes up on the back of my neck. This generation somehow feels that they're entitled to a period of indulgence of their flesh periodically. I don't know why that is. When I went to Perth, the, uh, the Beach Board Church, uh, the staff, you know, at the end of conference, because there's an overwhelming burden at conference time, you know, and you just got to take a break. They go up to Phuket in Thailand and go on video vacations, you know. What is it about this generation that feel that if you're under a little stress or, uh, or you've been... Uh, uh, worked a little while. You've got to indulge your flesh somehow. And then uh, along that line, we've had people who wanted to take a credit card vacation. They couldn't afford it, never recovered. And so the giants uh, of old age uh, have to do with your flesh. Uh, and you need to understand human dynamics. And human dynamics is uh, that involvement uh, in the work of God is vital to something inside you a spiritual dimension, don't ever do it. Say, Pastor, you know, I'm going to retire, and then I'm going to... Don't do it. If you retire, find a job immediately to do something. You must stay engaged, and this is especially true in a spiritual dimension because the giants of old age are always laying there. There's something that triggers responsibility in staying engaged, and it causes us to engage a spiritual dimension, and you need to understand that that's human dynamics. When I was saved as a new convert, I was asked to teach a junior high boys class. Now I want to tell you that will stretch you. <laughs> when I went to Bible school, 
they immediately asked me uh, if I were to teach a, an adult Bible class. I taught two adult Bible classes uh, in two different churches uh, and went to school at night. Uh, and I attribute uh, the uh, keeping my nose to the grindstone, the pressure of having to get a Sunday school lesson and having to stay engaged uh, I attribute that to something that God did inside me spiritually, uh, and as I did that, there was something that crystallized inside me of the determination uh, and the spiritual growth, but also something crystallized in me of uh, faithfulness uh, and stretching me. Listen to the, uh, the Bible tonight. In the book of uh, uh, Psalms chapter 18 and verse 36, David said, you enlarged my steps under me, so my feet uh, did not slip. There's something about uh, staying engaged, uh, and if possible, staying engaged in something that's beyond your ability, uh, that enlarges something inside you, uh, and that is literally fulfilled. Uh, your steps uh, are enlarged uh, after you, so that your feet uh, do not slip. God wants to bring forth from us uh, dynamic uh, and glorious potential. Uh, and the prophet says in Daniel 11 and verse 32, uh, those, uh, this is a last day prophecy, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong uh, and carry out great exploits. That's us. Can you say amen as we're in this arena? Can you say amen? Thank God. That's what God calls us to. And to accomplish that, we're going to have to stay engaged because one of the giants of old age uh, is to disengage uh, from the arena of conflict. I preached earlier in the week about David's mighty men. They were mighty men because they became engaged. Second Samuel 23, verses 11 and 12. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lintel. So the people fled from the Philistine. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistine. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Think about that now. Here's a man, and this man stirs himself. He's not afraid to die. He's risked. He stands in the midst of that. God helped him, and he defeated an army of the Philistines. And the Bible says the Lord brought about a great victory. I talked earlier in the week, First Chronicle chapter 11, uh, and verse 22, Benaiah was the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man from Kabzeel, who had done many mighty deeds. Uh, he killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. Uh, he also had gone down and killed a lion uh, in the midst of a pit uh, on a snowy day. Uh, and so here we have uh, a tremendous truth. As you read those words, you must understand uh, that these men kept themselves fit to be able to engage in a time of challenge and it's vitally important that you stay spiritually fit that you're able to engage the giants of old age move with me for a moment to the complacency of a position that you have arrived at how many of you know that God's favor often brings people to a place uh, of platform uh, and ministry. You cannot presume upon God. God gives positions, and in the Bible, Jesus has two disciples. One says, uh, you uh, granted that when you come into your kingdom, you're going to give us a, a place, one on the right and one on the left. Uh, and Jesus gives a answer that ought to sink deep into your heart. He says, that is not mine to give. Uh, that is my Father in heaven. That is his prer prerogative. Uh, and history emphasizes that any position that you have of ministry and spiritual dynamic and power in the kingdom of God, God gave you that. Say, no, he didn't. I maneuvered that. You know, I was... Uh, 
I uh, demonstrated before the pastor and I showed how great I am, how great I am. I prayed that, I played that song over, how great I am, and he heard it. <laughs> Listen to what I said. If you have achieved any spiritual position, God gave you that position. The moment you think that your tremendous ability your fantastic gifting has brought you there. You are dead because the Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. And that includes yours truly. How privileged to stand on this platform tonight and see the glorious things that God has done. God can take that at any time. Nebuchadnezzar is a great example for us. He's walking on the walls of the great city of Babylon. He's looking over this fantastic city that one of the seven wonders of the world are the hanging gardens of Babylon to this day. And he sees this, he said, look at this tremendous crowd that I've gathered here in this tent tonight. Uh, no, he said, look at this great city. My hands have built it. And in that moment, a voice came and said, bad words, buddy. I want you to walk on your, uh, on your knees and on your hands uh, and eat grass like a cow for seven years. His mind left him and he's insane. Listen to that. Are you listening tonight? If you have any position, if you have any platform, if you have any success, I want to tell you, God gave that to you. Don't presume upon that. You can't presume upon God. Here's David, and the Bible says he's in battle, and David grew faint. Listen to me for a moment. You do not have the same strength at 60 that you had at 17. That brings some dynamics that are very, very crucial to you tonight. Listen to me, because some of the giants of old age are waiting down the road to kill you. And we have the story here, and that story is there, and we have a man. We read this story that when Goliath appeared on the field, David ran to meet him. He's filled with confidence. The Spirit of God is all over him. And he runs to meet Goliath, uh, takes him down, uh, because uh, God will use men who will stay humble and will trust him. Listen to what the poet says uh, 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 tonight. God, give us men. The time demands strong minds, great hearts, True faith and willing hands. Men whom the lust of office does not kill. Men whom the spoils of office cannot buy. Men who possess opinions and a will. Men who have honor. Men who will not lie. Will you bear with me while I give you a long quote? This is a fantastic quote. This author says the middle years of life are probably the most perilous. Some time ago, it is said that an editor started the opinion that middle age runs graver risks of moral breakdown than youth. And asked why so many sermons were directed at men in their 20s instead of so few addressed to them in their 40s. To which the sly reply was that the latter who pay pew Rentals. Youth has its temptations uh, to fling away health, money, time in the mad rush uh, for delicious pleasure, keen excitement, uh, and the indulgence of unbridled energies. Uh, age has its temptations to rot in a house, uh, or the white ants of the east uh, eat out the very soul of the soul. Whilst, me whilst men have not found their groove uh, and are still striving to get a footing uh, when they're 
uh, breasting the hill against difficulty or fighting their battle against tremendous odds uh, when they've not yet taken their position, visions uh, and dreams uh, and dream dreams. Uh, they're capable of romance, poetry, and love. They're enthusiastic for noble causes. They have untarnished ideals. Uh, their soul responds to the call of a difficult or lost cause. Uh, they long for the hour to come when they shall uh, wield a wide influence uh, and have the power of helping forward what they have uh, espoused. Uh, their souls are ardent and enthusiastic. The springs of hope uh, uh, rise ever within them. Defeat, stagnation, apathy seem alike impossible. But how great the change uh, when the position is won and the rank of society assured then they settle down to hard matter of fact. They've lost the glow of dawn, and their skies are gray. There's no aura now, no passion, no enthusiasm. The fate of a people fighting for liberty mainly interests them because of its effect on the value of securities. They smile at the memory of romance and passion with which life once was colored. Don't presume upon God. Now, there are several things that we could touch on as we're moving through this. Uh, let's think for a moment about the churches of Revelation. The churches of Revelation have been established. They are thriving centers of revival. They are candlestick churches. Uh, this is why they're written about. They, we read in the book of Revelation about the church of Sardis. Uh, we some years ago went into the seven churches of Revelation tour, went to some of these cities. In the city of Sardis, it was built, uh, and they used the natural terrain, uh, and the entire city was enclosed by a wall that wanders over a vast domain. Uh, and uh, on one uh, southern side of this, they used the natural terrain of a cliff. The walls were on top of the cliff, uh, and they used that for a part of their uh, structure. And an enemy came and was trying to uh, see a way to get into the city. And as they're observing from a distance, trying to spy out how they might uh, breach the walls or breach the gates, uh, and as they're watching, uh, a Sardinian soldier was on the wall, uh, and as he was on the wall, uh, he dropped his helmet over this cliff, uh, and as they observed him, uh, he found a place and climbed down the cliff uh, and retrieved his helmet, climbed back up, uh, and when they saw that, said, that's the way. And at night, they came in, killed the guards, uh, and overthrew the city. That's why in the church of Sardis, Jesus said, watch. There is another church that's mentioned that's worth our uh, mentioning. It's the church of Laodicea. This was a powerful church. It was a very wealthy church. Uh, when they had an earthquake, uh, uh, Rome uh, offered to rebuild it. They refused uh, because this was a proud city. It was a very wealthy city. Uh, and uh, we have a lesson there because this brings us to the place where one of the giants of old age, uh, in addition to not being alert and staying on your guard always, uh, is... Uh, you no longer have to pray about money. In the book of Revelations, it talks about Laodicea. It says, you think that you're rich and you have no need. But he said, I want to tell you that you are very, very poor because you have laid aside the spiritual things for the worldly wealth. We have a church in Thyatira spoken of and in the church of Thyatira, there's a giant that has taken over, and that's the pastor's wife. Now, ladies, don't give me the mean eye. I've been at this a long time. I'm not intimidated by women. Neither do I preach at them all the time, but it uh, is good to us tonight to recognize that a giant uh, has taken over the city of uh, Thyatira. There's a woman. That woman is Jezebel. She's the pastor's wife. Uh, she's in leadership. Uh, she runs that church, uh, and that's one of the giants of old age. The complacency of position uh, 
uh, begins uh, and begins to lay hold sometimes invisibly. Uh, but you need to understand, never depend on your own ability. The moment you're going to depend upon your own ability, your fall is assured. We had some brethren a couple of times in our history that have felt they don't need the fellowship anymore. I had some information from an insider said all, uh, all uh, three of these men had laid up in a in a secret bank account, $200,000 uh, for the day uh, when they're going to pull out of the fellowship. Uh, but I want to tell you that uh, you can't outsmart God. Can you say amen? We just had a new book. You've got to get it if you haven't got it already. Uh, Still Taking the Land. Our original book was We Can Take the Land. Uh, and one of the wits uh, at uh, our breakfast table said, you should have entitled this uh, Still Taking the Land Without You. When you get to the place that you think you can not depend, you don't have to depend on the fellowship. You don't have to depend on the leadership and their quaint old standards that they're hung up on. Your fate is sealed in that moment. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7, And what do you have that you did not receive? Now if you did re indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Uh, or in other words, Nebuchadnezzar, when you say, My own hands have got this, I know how to do this, you're a dead man. Zechariah 4 6 tells us again, this is a Pentecostal quote. Most Pentecostals can say this by heart, or at least they could before the yuppies all took over and began to hate Pentecostalism. And Pentecostalism, we are Pentecostal. How many of you know we're Pentecostal? We are a Pentecostal fellowship. We are a tongue-talking, devil-chasing Pentecostal fellowship, not ashamed of it. And if you get hung up on that, too bad for you. Zechariah 4, verse 6, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, uh, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, and this uh, then uh, is uh, the danger that you have. You think you know how to do this. This is a work of God. You've heard me say it, I want to say it. This is a work of God. This is not a work of man. This is not my genius. This is not even my slick personality, which I do not have. This is not my superiority. I know last night the man said Superman and Spider-Man and Wayman, but that's not true. The greatest danger, perhaps, of our generation, as Pastor Payne so ably took that offering, the greatest danger we have uh, is money. In Deuteronomy 8 and verse 18, says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, uh, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers it is this day. Or in other words, uh, when you begin to presume uh, that God has blessed you, and so now you have the finances uh, to be independent of the fellowship, uh, independent of leadership, uh, your fate is sealed. Heads up, right here, let's go back to their, our text. Here's David, uh, and as David's there, uh, he grows faint, uh, and uh, here's uh, Ishbosh Bosheth. This uh, giant uh, says, This is my chance. I'm going to kill uh, the champion uh, of Israel. Uh, he moves on him, uh, and when he moves on him, uh, there's a man that is there whose name is Abishai, uh, and Abishai steps in uh, and slays him uh, and saves David. Listen to me. You want to be sure in your ministry that you do not surround yourself uh, with a bunch of clone yes men uh, and not real men uh, who have caught the spirit of our fellowship. Amen. See, it costs Abishai something. Can you say amen? It costs Abishai something. It costs him the risk of his own life. This is no... Uh, this is no kindergarten kid that's standing out there uh, that's going to kill David. This is a monster man. He's a man filled with demon power. He's uh, uh, energized from hell, uh, and he sees his opportunity, and he's going to take David out. And Abishai uh, has a loyalty uh, 
to what David stands for, and he's not afraid to risk his life. Be sure, Pastor, that you, are sound, you surround your, yourself with real people who are willing to stand with you in the desperate times uh, and not some clone that's saying, Yes, Pastor, yes, Pastor, yes, Pastor. Believes in what you believe in and will stand with you Surround yourself with those people. Giants of old age. Then I want to touch tonight on family dynamics. Here's where it gets hairy. Don't walk out on me. This is a crucial element. And the Bible underlines this in Genesis 18 and verse 19. God says, I have known Abraham in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So here is the family dynamic that we need to talk about. God's structure is framed in family. In the book of Psalms 68 and verse 6, the Bible says these words, God sets a solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the righteous dwell, uh, but, uh, but the rebellious dwell, rather, in a dry land. Now, David is conflicted in his family. Listen very carefully to me, Pastor. This may be the, the most profound lesson that you'll ever learn. And some pastors, as I said some 15 years ago, that the greatest test of our fellowship in the next 10 years is going to be pastors and their family. Let's look first of all at Michael, David's wife. David goes down, as I said, Monday night. He gets the ark six miles from Jerusalem. Saul wasn't interested in it, but David wanted the presence of God. He brings it up, and as it brings it up, he is so overwhelmed with joy, he begins to dance before the Lord and sing, and he's clothed with a, with a linen ephod, and he is so exuberant about this wonderful thing that God has done. And he goes home that day, and his wife, Michael, says she resents his dedication she resents uh, uh, his uh, uh, headship, uh, and uh, as he comes home, she says to him, Weren't you a pretty sight today, David? You're out there dancing before the Lord in a linen ephod, and you shined your chonies to all these women out there. <laughs> There's a bitter woman. And it was Solomon... That the Bible says when he was old, his wives turned his heart from the Lord. In the Bible, leadership and family is a bottom line in the requirements of God. The scripture says plainly, leaders must have their own house in order. This is sad history in the Bible. And that sad history is in David's own household. He has a son. That son's name is Amnon. That son rapes a related family relative, which is Tamar. And David did not discipline him. I want to tell you that one of the crucial issues for you surviving in ministry is you're not afraid to discipline your own household. Listen carefully to me. Here's Eli. He's the high priest, and the Bible says Eli would not restrain his own sons who are exploiting the women that come to the tabernacle to worship sexually, and he would not restrain them, and because of that, he lost tremendous credibility, not only with the people of Israel, but also with God. See, credibility is something very valuable. Credibility means that you're living a life uh, whereby you are not partial. That means you will judge without partiality. The Bible speaks over and over again about not having partiality. That means favoritism. And it's crucial 
that as you live life and the giants of life, this is a giant of life, the giant of life that you're going to meet as you live in life has to do with your family and your credibility hinges on that. And credibility means that when you speak, they listen to you and hear what you have to say because you have credibility. Credibility is one of the precious uh, uh, commodities uh, when you begin to understand that uh, you must maintain this. Integrity is absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, this is true about money. It's true about your lifestyle. But it's also true about your family because your ministry hinges uh, upon your credibility. Now, another danger I need to kick in here is nepotism. Nepotism is a deadly factor in the kingdom of God. This means that you're going to elevate your family to positions that they have not earned. We have some sad cases of this. It's called rifts in the, in, in the congregation. A son is favored. His shortcomings and sins are overlooked. He's favored. He's given position. Uh, beyond uh, uh, what he has earned. Uh, and that will create a, dis a dissension. That will create uh, a crisis of your credibility and your integrity. You plant him and you uh, give him uh, everything on planet earth. Uh, and meanwhile, somebody else is not a family. You don't give them anything. Uh, or you give them just enough to keep the wolf from the door. That will compute out on you, pastor. Be very careful. You don't put your son in a position until he's earned that position. And first of all, send him out among the giants. Ooh, did you feel that? I felt that. <laughs> Nepotism means uh, that you want to put your family uh, in staff uh, and your sons are given position, partiality and position uh, support and then brings this back to favoritism in uh, discipleship. Maybe... You have a daughter. Your daughter fails morally. You see, if you want to survive, you won't just cover that over and excuse that. Uh, you will judge that so that the congregation knows uh, that that has been judged uh, because your entire future hinges uh, on credibility of that. Oh, I felt that. What an anointing. Yes, amen. Everybody shouting amen. Absalom was a favorite. Have you ever read in the scripture that Absalom had 50 men that ran before him and said, Here comes Absalom. Here comes Absalom. Get ready. I can't even imagine that. And his father didn't know about that and let that go on because that, uh, that attributed uh, to the ruin uh, of Absalom uh, in the process of time. Uh, and uh, remember... Seeds are planted now. You're young. You're just starting your ministry. But I want to tell you that the seeds of giants uh, are planted years before they start to come to fruition. Uh, but if you do not face these, uh, they will become the giants of old age uh, and they threaten to destroy uh, your ministry. Remember, none of these that I'm spoke speaking about uh, manifest themselves uh, but they can be a major issue, uh, and they're a major issue uh, in churches uh, today. You can finish your life uh, with a shout of praise. Can you say amen? amen? Think of the Apostle Paul. Here this man is. Uh, he is an old man, and as he's at the end of his life, uh, he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and said, Timothy, uh, I have kept the faith uh, I have finished my course. Uh, henceforth, uh, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to me, uh, and not only to me, but all those uh, who keep the faith uh, until the end. I want to survive till the end. Can you say amen? amen. I want to come to the end of the road, uh, and if Jesus comes uh, before that, I want to be the first to go up in this city. Uh, can you say amen? amen. And if not, uh, if I go by the way of collapsing, I want to collapse while I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. 
But I want to go out to the giants of greed, the giants of lust, the giants of rebellion, the giants of carelessness, the giants of pride, the giants of lust, and all of these things have not overtaken me. The giants of old age are great danger. Bow your head tonight as we come to the